Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Bing Crosby and Dorothy L'Amour in Dixie with Barry Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This town has given me many unforgettable memories, but none clearer than the sight of Bing Crosby in blackface and sideburns, wearing a shirt that might have been made from one of Dorothy L'Amour's sarongs, bicycling down a street on the Paramount lot, puffing gently on a pipe and warbling one of the tunes from Dixie. That was the day I wrote Santa Claus and asked him to bring us Dixie for Christmas. Bing, having just finished the picture going my way at Paramount, accepted Santa's invitation to go our way. And then the old gentleman delivered in prodigal style by bringing us Dorothy L'Amour and Barry Sullivan in the same package. Barry is the promising young actor who makes his big-time debut in Paramount's Lady in the Dark. Dixie is the story of a song that's been on the hit parade for about 100 years. And tonight you'll hear Bing sing Dixie and some of the other great hits of the picture. By bringing you tonight's play... I think Lux Flakes provides the perfect opportunity to relax before your last-minute Christmas shopping. For months now, the people of America have been accustomed to buying fewer things and making the old ones last longer. That's certainly much less fun than getting a new car, new clothes, a new refrigerator, or what have you. But it does represent a real contribution to the nation. And by helping to keep things looking new in the Department of Washable Fabrics, Lux Flakes makes the whole idea easier to take. Now for something that's very easy to take. We raise the curtain on the first act of Dixie, starring Bing Crosby as Dan Emmett and Dorothy L'Amour as Millie, with Barry Sullivan as Mr. Bones. In the period before the Civil War, a new form of entertainment flashed across the American scene, the minstrel show. This is the story of the first of the great minstrels, Daniel Decatur Emmett, who donned burnt cork and sang his way into the heart of a nation with his immortal song, Dixie. Daniel Emmett came from a peaceful little town on the Mississippi, peaceful and drowsy, except that on this Sunday afternoon, a fire has broken out in the big house on the hill. Where's the fire? The mason place. Look at it go. Well, get the fire wagon moving. Come on. We can't. Dan Emmett's got the key. What? The key to the firehouse. Dan Emmett's got it. Dan Emmett. Where's Dan Emmett? Hey, Dan Emmett. Has anyone seen Dan Emmett? Where's Dan Emmett? The key to the firehouse is resting comfortably in Dan Emmett's pocket. And Dan Emmett himself is resting comfortably on the riverbank with his banjo on his knee. And there's a girl beside him listening with shining eyes as he sings. Won't you tell me when we will meet again Sunday, Monday, or always If you're satisfied I'll be at your side Sunday, Monday, or always no need to tell me now what makes the world go round When at the sight of you my heart begins to pound and pound What am I to do? Can't I be with you? Sunday, Monday, or always Dan, that's the nicest song you've written yet. You like it, Jean? Sunday, Monday, or always. Well, never mind the Sunday and the Monday part, but don't you forget about always. Hey. What is it? I thought for a second I smelled smoke. Oh, Dan, you're always smelling smoke. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's being head of the volunteer fire brigade. job like that carries a lot of responsibility. Yes, sir. You've got to be right up on your toes every second. Dan. Dan, look. Hmm? It is smoke. Where? Up there on the hill. Dan, it's my house. Your house? Well, well, come on. I got to get over there. I got the key to the firehouse. Might as well go home, Dan. She's burnt right out. Yeah. Take the engines away, boys. Too bad. 
Well, you certainly were a dang long time getting here. Now, look at my house. Just look we at it. We couldn't help it, Mr. Mason. Dan had the key to the firehouse, and we couldn't locate him. What, Dan Emmett? Yeah, I'm... I'm sorry, Mr. Mason. There's not much left, is there? Oh, yes, there is. Your pipe, Dan Emmett. I found it in what was the hall. Let's see there. Well, it's my pipe, all right, but I don't remember leaving it there. Well, I'm sure he didn't, Father. He certainly did. That's where the fire started. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mason. I'll, I'll pay you back when I can. Well, the house happens to be insured. Oh, then everything's all right. All right. With me and my family out in the cold, you irresponsible pup. You're no good, and I don't ever want to see you around here or around my daughter again. Father! Now, Mr. Mason, I guess this isn't a very good time to bring it up, but I can't very well never see your daughter again. I'm planning on marrying her. Marry my daughter? Yes. How could you support her? Well, I'm not exactly destitute. I got $500. That's no credit to you. Your uncle left you five hundred and fifty eight years ago. Well, I, I'm quitting my job in the feed store. I'm going to be an actor and a composer. What? Oh. <laughs> Father, please. Now, play actors make a lot of money, Mr. Mason. Yes, the good ones do. But you start play acting, and in six months, you won't have a cent left. Oh, I think you're wrong there, Mr. Mason. In six months, I'll have twice as much money. <laughs> well, you come back here in six months with a thousand dollars, and you can marry Jean. And I'd rather cut off my right arm than have that happen. So you can see what I think your chances are. All right, Mr. Mason, but you better start saving rice. You're going to need a lot of it six months from now. Dan. I'll be around tonight to say goodbye, Jean. I'm taking the next riverboat south. Keep those stevedores moving there. Get that cutting aboard. I looked up at Jordan, but what did I see? Coming for the carry me home. Oh, To carry me home, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. Band of angels coming after me. Come in for to carry me home. Now, good afternoon, sir. Oh, good afternoon. I was on the upper deck, sir, listening to your singing. Very lovely indeed, sir. Thanks. Thanks very much. You're a professional, no doubt. Oh, uh, yes, of course. I knew it, I knew it. One professional can always spot another. Here, you a play actor? Mr. Bones, world's champion Bones player and unsurpassed on the concertina. No doubt you've heard of me. Uh, y- yes, yes, of course. Ah, I see you were foresighted enough to bring along a box lunch, sir. Mm-hmm, my girl did it up for me. Wh- where have you been appearing lately, Mr. Bones? No? Huh? Oh, I, I've been abroad the last two years, touring the continent. Command performances before royalty. Yes, a box lunch is a handy little thing to have on a boat, yes, indeed. Oh, but I'm interrupting your snack. Go right ahead. Do you need, sir? Oh, I can eat any time. Oh, no, I wouldn't think of it. Go right ahead, please. Well, if you don't mind, Not at all. It's too bad I didn't think to have my manservant fix one for me. Then I could join you. Oh, say, I don't suppose you, you, uh... Oh, no, of course you wouldn't. May I inquire, sir, what I wouldn't do? Well, I was going to ask if you'd care to dine with me. Ah, no, no, thank you, sir. I'm dining with the captain. Oh, I'm sorry. However, if you insist, I won't disappoint you, sir. Ah, chicken. Chicken, sir, is a thing I am fondest of in all the world. My, my, the provisions are all gone. We had quite an appetite, didn't we? Yes, if we eat like that very often, you're going to gain a lot of weight. Uh, tell me, Mr. Remmett, in what theater do you next unleash that golden voice of yours? Right now, I'm not working. Well, uh, don't you find that a bit awkward, being without funds? Mm, well, I had a little windfall from an uncle of mine. Little windfall, or are you just being modest? Well, it was only $500. Well, after all, it's not really the money. It's just knowing that your uncle didn't forget you. Well, well, how shall we spend this pleasant afternoon? Would you care to play some uh, cards? Not for money, of course. No, I don't know much about cards. Well, I don't know much about cards either. I just happen to have these with me. 
We'll play a very simple game. We'll cut the cards and the high man wins. Now, cut up. Now, your queen of hearts against my two of spades. You win. I win? Yes, let's try it again. Uh, cut up. Ace of spades. Well, there's no use my drawing. You win again. Uh, once more, sir. Thank you. Oh, you got me this time. Seven of clubs. Eh? And I have the six of clubs. Oh, by Jupiter, but you're lucky. You know, it's too bad we aren't playing for money. You'd make a fortune. Maybe we'd better play something else. Huh? Uh, no, sir. I'm determined to win at this game. Uh, just to put some incentive into it, Mr. Remett, um, I'll play you for a dollar. All right, put up your money. Well, no, no, never mind that. I'll trust you. Ah, the king of spades. Now I've got you. Oop. The ace again. Mr. Emmett, how do you do it? I'll tell you what. I'll play you for $10. The same game? Same game. Oh, you may be sorry. <laughs> that could be. Uh-huh. That could be. Evening, sir. You seasixer? Hmm? Oh, no, steward. Anything I can get for you? Yeah, you can get me five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars? No, never mind. Come. Excuse me, sir, but is these yours? Are these cards under the napkin? Take them away. Uh, yes, sir. Why, there's six aces of spades here. There's what? Six aces? Let me see. Unless you was playing with six decks, it looks dishonest to me. Steward, where's Mr. Bones' stateroom? Mr. Bones, sir? Yes, where is he? Well, Mr. Bones got off back there at Martin's Ferry and took the fastest packet to New Orleans. New Orleans, huh? All right, thanks. Mr. Bones! Hey, Bones! Hey, come here. Why, why, it's Mr. Emmett. Yes, it's Mr. Emmett. A delightful surprise. Glad to see you in New Orleans. If you're going to be here long, you must look me up. I've been looking you up for three weeks. Come here. Uh, Mr. Emmett, I... Stand still now. I want my $500. $500? Yes. Are you by any chance referring to the money I won from you at time? I'm referring to the money you cheated me out of. That's a very harsh statement, Mr. Emmett. Why do you make it? Because I found six aces of spades on your chair after you left the boat. Oh, well, hundreds of people have sat in that chair. Why accuse me? Because you're a crook. That, sir, is almost an insult. You say I cheated you, Mr. Remmett. I say I didn't. That settles it. Good day, sir. Oh, no, you don't. I want my money, and I want it right now. I'd be very glad to return the money to you to put an end to this bickering, but the sad fact is the money is gone. Gone? All of it? Every sou. Well, I'm going to take it out of your hide. Now, hold on, Emmett. Hold on. If you're, if you're hungry, I'll, I'll get you a meal, a fine meal. I thought you were broke. Well, that has nothing to do with it. Help me find a cockroach. I'm not that hungry. Now, you don't understand, sir. I find a nice, healthy cockroach and place it in my wallet. We go to a restaurant and order a fine repast. At the conclusion of the dinner, I take the cockroach from my pocket and deposit it on the plate. Then I leave the establishment in a huff. You mean a hearse. Oh, have no fears, sir. Come along. I've enjoyed many an exquisite meal with a cockroach. Yeah, who was whose guest? Ah, it's a delicious meal, wasn't it? Now, if there's anything else you want, we'll order it. I want you to be perfectly satisfied. Don't you get the idea this cancels the 500 you owe me. You're going to pay back every cent. You've got to go to work on the levy to do it. Shh, Mr. Emmett, if you'll cease this petty persecution, I'll sponsor you in the theater. I'll make a place for you in my act. How's that? I'd rather have the 500. Come on, get the cockroach out. Let's go. Yes, I... Oh, wait. Wait, dear, dear. Huh? What's, what's the trouble? I, uh, I can't find it. Can't find what? The cockroach. Uh, he's gone. Perhaps he's crawled on you. What are we going to do? Uh, did you lose something, gentlemen? Oh, I, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, yes, waiter. I, um, I seem to have misplaced my wallet. And me too. Both of you have lost your wallets? I think we've been robbed, yes. That, gentlemen, you should be ashamed to use. If I were going to steal a meal, I would have a more original approach. Well, we did have. <laughs> I'll be glad to sign the bill and send you my check in the morning. It won't be necessary. We can work out something right here. Oh, come on. Let go of me. No money, eh? Oh, unhand me, you. No money. Let go of me. Wonderful food, wasn't it? Did you have enough to eat? Yeah, but I'd hate to have to do it three times a day. This is my boarding house. Not much of an establishment, but you're welcome to be my guest until we get set. Looks great to me. All I want is a place to lie down and bleed. Be very quiet now. Someone's sick. Just a minute, you. Ah, Miss Cook. Trying to sneak in again, are you? Miss Cook, I'm glad I ran into you. I want you to meet a fellow artist of mine, the famous Mr. Dan Emmett. We've toured together. From the looks of you, I'd say you toured several bars together. <laughs> Miss Cook is quite a wit. Well, come along, Emmett. Just a moment, Mr. Bones. At the risk of being a bore, I'm going to ask you for your rent again. Miss Cook, I've discussed that thoroughly with your father. 
He understands that when I've decided which local engagement to accept, I can reimburse him. And just where do you think you're taking Miss Emmett? To my room. Oh, no, you don't. You might have made a deal with my father for yourself, but one deadbeat per room is enough. Now, wait a minute. How do you know I'm a deadbeat? I haven't been here long enough to be one. Well, you can remove all doubt by paying your rent in advance. Oh, well, uh... Mr. Bone! Well, old time, I'm delighted to see you. I want you to meet one of my colleagues, the famous Mr. Dan Emmett. Dan, this is Mr. Cook. Well, Mr. Emmett, I trust that you're going to stay with us for a while. Well, I thought I'd... No, he isn't, Father. I'm sick and tired of this. Every room in this house is full of down-and-out actors who came to you and flattered you with a little theatrical talk and settled down to live off us. Millicent, my child. Of course, we know that you don't mean that. You're tired out. Of course I'm tired out. From sweeping and scrubbing and taking and sewing to pay the bills. we got to draw the line somewhere, and we might as well draw it through Mr. Emmett. I'd like to draw it right through Mr. Bones, too. He not only doesn't pay his rent, but he tries to kiss me every time he catches me in the back hall. My dear, you forget you're very attractive, and actors are emotional people. Besides, Mr. Bones said he would pay us when he had an engagement. Now he has one. Oh, uh, where? Uh, while you were out this morning, a messenger came from the Maxwell Theater. The manager wants to try out your act tonight. Ah, uh, they've always loved me here in New Orleans. I imagine this engagement will be sensational. Well, come on, then. Let's start putting our routine together. Our routine? Mm-hmm. And why do you use the plural pronoun? We made a deal. You agreed to take me in with you. Oh, that was a hypothetical case. Some time in the future, yes. Tonight, however, I am doing a single. If you do, you'll be doing it in your underwear. And what do you mean by that? This is too good a chance to miss. We can get two jobs instead of one. In fact, we can get four by using those two broken-down actors in room six. That means four actors paying rent instead of none. So, Mr. Bones, you better change your mind if you don't want your clothes locked in your room. Well, what do you say, Mr. Bones? Do we go with you or do we lock you up? Wait. What are you going to do about those black eyes you're wearing? Makeup won't cover those. Don't expect a solution from me. I know what you could do. You can't change the color of your eyes, but you can make your faces up to match them. Go as Darky. Miss Cook, if you think the audience would stand for our masquerading as Africans, why, why, we'd be run out of the theater. Well, I'd rather be run out of it than never get in there at all. Come on. Say there, Rasmus, what do you do for a living? What's that? What do I do for a living? That's what I say. Well, I do as little as possible. Yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> Say there, Mr. Man, I bet you's a lion with a lady. That's what I is, brother, and you ain't just lying. <laughs> out of my sight till we settle the terms of your rent. Oh, yeah. On top of that, I I just couldn't cope with Mr. Bones tonight. He has the instincts of a boa constrictor. <laughs> I knew he was a snake, but I wasn't sure what kind. I have to fight him off three times a day. Why don't you speak to your father? My father? Yeah. He's about as much protection as a lace shawl. You know, I have an idea that you're pretty able to take care of yourself, too. I've been doing it since I was nine. How long have you been an actor, Mr. Amos? Not very long. I didn't think so. 
An experienced actor would have kissed me before I'd gone ten feet. Well, I'm not that inexperienced. But I thought of it before we'd gone five feet. Then why didn't you? Hmm? Why don't you? I think we should have gone five feet further. <laughs> In just a moment, Mr. DeMille presents Bing Crosby, Dorothy Lamour, and Barry Sullivan in Act Two of Dixie. During this brief intermission, Sally wants to introduce a special guest. For an impossible interview. He certainly looks impossible to me. But this was your idea, Sally. He's your friend. My friend? I should say not. He hasn't a friend in the world. Well, speak up, man. Who are you? Well, you know how stockings pop into runs sometimes for no reason at all, like this. <coughs> well, I'm the guy who pops them. You wouldn't have a chance if some people weren't careless about washing stockings, rubbing them with cake soap or using strong soap. Then the threads get weak. <laughs> then I come along and pop them, and they never guess what happened. Boy, oh boy, is that fun. You're a mean man. Stockings are so precious these days. That's what I like. A run. <laughs> Makes people complain about their stockings. And all the time, it may be because they've been washing stockings the wrong way. You don't do much business when girls luck their stockings every night. Mm, no, I don't have any fun. Stockings last twice as long when they're luxed every night. Of course they do. They stay elastic so they can stretch and spring back into place without breaking into runs. Yes, that's why it pays to luck stockings nightly and never risk strong soaps or cake soap rubbing. Actual strain tests prove lux cuts down runs over 50%. That's twice the wear with gentle Lux Care. Don't waste Lux Flakes. Use all you need to get rich suds, but no more than you need. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Two of Dixie, starring Bing Crosby as Dan Emmett and Dorothy Lamour as Millie, with Barry Sullivan as Mr. Bones. <laughs> the minstrel show has been born in New Orleans. It's still only four men in burnt cork, but the idea is catching on. Dan Emmett has plans now. Two dozen men on the stage at one time. Costumes, dances, funny sayings, and brand new songs. Bum, 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 Hello. Oh, good morning, Millie. I hear you had standees at the theater again last night. Well, we haven't had a vacant seat for the oh, last two weeks. Bum, 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 Don't you ever get tired of working? You're at the theater all night. I shouldn't think you'd want to be writing songs all day. Well, I'm not getting anywhere with this one. The tune keeps running through my mind, but I can't think of any words for it. What you need is to relax. Why don't we take a walk this afternoon? It's a wonderful day. Well, I don't know. That, that walking maybe, maybe isn't so good. I, hey, I smell smoke. Smoke? Hey, look out. It's my, my pipe on those papers. Oh, Dan, don't burn yourself. That's all right. Hey, that was close. I got into trouble like that once before. Let me see your hand. Did you burn it? Just a little. Let me see. Oh, Dan, I... I'm so sorry. No, it's not bad. Look. Here, let go, will you? Hmm? Let go of my neck. Dan, kiss me. Well, here we go. Good morning. Oh, Father. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was looking for Mr. Bones. He's going to enlarge his act, you know, and I might even consider going back on the stage myself. Oh, go right ahead with what you were doing. I'll see Mr. Bones presently. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He said for us to go on with what we were doing. Millie, I think it's a pretty good thing he came in. See, I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm in love with Jean, and I'm going to marry her. If that girl really meant anything to you, you couldn't kiss me like that. Well, you sort of sneaked up on me. Oh, did I? Well, I'm not going to sneak up on you anymore. Hey, Millie. <laughs> Virginia 
Good luck, Father. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Good luck to all of you. Uh, thank you, my sweet. Thanks. And I suppose, Mr. Emmett, if you are successful tonight, you'll be racing back to marry that girl of yours. Yeah, or sending for her to come here. Oh, won't that be nice? Perhaps we can make it a double wedding. Mr. Bones and I are getting married, too. We are? When did I ask you? You didn't. But if you weren't leading up to it, you're a cad. Well, I don't mind. At least we can try it for a while. Well, aren't you... Aren't you going to congratulate us, Father? Well, well, my little girl mad. Seems only yesterday that you were in pigtails. My congratulations to both of you. Uh, which ones you say you were marrying? I believe she designated me. Oh, really? I'm safe, <laughs> ready for the curtain. Good luck again, Father. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, Bye, Nellie. Uh, you didn't congratulate me, Emmett? Congratulations. Your enthusiasm overwhelms me. Thank you! Thank you! And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tambo Jones will sing a song about a horse and carriage. Mr. Tambo Jones! By the way, have you tried going out for a little buggy ride with a girl by your side and a horse that knows the way back home from her scarred rosy lane while a lark in the meadow entertains and you can drop the rain with a horse that knows the way back home. And between all the farms, you can then use your arm to express what you long to say. And you won't mind at all if the horse wants to stall, just to try out the new moan hay. So if you should decide to go out for a little buggy ride, and perhaps win a prize. Get a horse that knows the way back, either black or brown, it's way back, but a horse that knows the way back home. Will Antoine's be all right, Millie? It's all right with me. We really ought to celebrate this occasion, you know, the show of success, our engagement, driver Antoine. Yes. Wait, hold that cab, driver. Millie, can I see you a minute? I'm sorry, we're just going to... Well, this is important. What is it? Well, I can't tell you here. Couldn't we, couldn't we go some other place? My fiancé is already going someplace. Millie, you can't be engaged to Mary Bones. You don't love him, and I know it. Really? Look here, Emmett, your conduct is unforgivable. Don't try me too far. Millie, the minute I heard you say you were marrying him tonight, I knew I couldn't let you go. Emmett, in a very few moments, you're going to have a fight on your hands. Oh, don't bother to brawl with him, Bones, darling. Have the cabbie throw him out. Millie, I don't blame you for feeling hurt after the way I treated you, but I'm sure of myself. Now, I, it's you I want. Get your elbow out of my stomach and quit proposing to my fiancé. Millie, please listen to me. What do you want to do, start a harem with me and that girl of yours? I'm just trying to put over the idea that I want to marry you. Dan. Emmett, my patience is almost exhausted. Oh, Dan, darling, I'm so glad you said that. I'll marry you tonight if you want me to. Darling. Millie, this transcends decency. I demand an explanation. Well, how can we make it any clearer to you? Oh, Millie. Oh, Dan. Well, I must say, this was the shortest engagement on record. Listen, what? There's a fire somewhere. Oh, there it is. Good heavens, it's the theater. The theater? The... Oh, Dan. Hey, I can't find it. What? I thought I had it with me. Had what? My pipe. Oh, Dan. What an eventful evening. The show was a triumph. I've been engaged to two men and the theater burns down. I wonder what'll happen next. May I say I've had enough? Oh, don't be depressed, Dan. You'll be back at work as soon as the theater is rebuilt. We can use that time to get married and have a honeymoon. Well, before we get married, I think I'd better go back and talk to Jean. Go back? Well, why don't you write her a letter? You can write, can't oh, you? Oh, you can't break that kind of news in a letter. You know how it is in small towns. People sort of pair you off, and when it doesn't go through, it's a tragedy. Really, the only decent thing for me to do is go back and talk to her in person. I just got to make her understand. That may be decent, but I think it's silly. What do you expect me to do while you're gone? Uh, miss me, I hope. I don't get this, Mr. Mason. I come all the way from New Orleans just to see... I'll tell you again, Jean doesn't want to see you, Dan. Well, why not, Mr. Mason? I got something important to tell her. I can give her any messages. Not this one, Mr. Mason. I've got to speak to her myself. All right. Come here to the window. 
There's Jean in the garden. Why? Why, she's... Yeah, she's in a wheelchair. She's been in it for weeks. What happened to her? Did she have an accident? Jean has the paralyzing sickness. She'll never walk again. So that's why she didn't want to see me. She doesn't want your pity, Dan. Well, she ought to know better than that, Mr. Mason. You see, I came back here to marry Jean. Dear Millie, I suppose you've been wondering why I haven't written. Millie, there's no gentle or easy way I can say this, so... So I'll tell you right out. I'm... I'm married to Jean. I can't explain it because there's, there's nothing to explain. We're in New York where I'm working on some new songs. <laughs> Now you're going to hear this new song. Oh, I feel like a baby the way you carry me around. Oh, you married a strong guy. <laughs> now you just sit there and listen. All right, Master. I hope you think it was worth the trip from the kitchen when you hear it. You need a pillow, Jean? No, thanks. I'm fine, darling. All right. Did I see moonlight and magnolia trees? Smile again, my darling. If you please Did I hear music On a warm spring breeze Speak again My darling, if you please Did I feel cool September rain Just then If you please Touch my cheek with your hand again When you are near me I can dream with ease And I'm yours My darling If you Dan, that was lovely. You really think so, honey? It's the best thing you ever wrote. Oh, you're a wonderful audience, Jean. You like them all. Of course I have, because they're all wonderful songs. Why don't you try that new publisher you were talking about? I'm going to. This morning. I'm going to start right at the top and bombard them with my collected works. Keep your fingers crossed, huh? Oh, good luck, darling. And hurry back. You know something? You're the bravest little wife a fella ever starved with. <laughs> And I'm yours, my darling, if you please. Well? No, it ain't a good season for ballads. We're looking for something like, uh, the farmer pitched hay all day. Oh, then I got just the song you want. Turkey in the straw. I don't want any songs about animals. Not about an animal, it's about a turkey. Turkey? Yeah. That reminds me, it's time for lunch. Now, wait, wait a second. I've played you ten songs, they're all good numbers, you must like one of them. All right, I'll give you a hundred dollars. For which song? For all of them. That's only $10 a song. I can add two. Do you want it? Well, I don't want it, but I need it. All right. I'll get you the money in an hour. Look, I got one more song. It's my best. I've been working on it for a long time, but I just got the words today. Listen. Oh, I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times there. Are hold not... it, hold it. Well? I'll give you a dollar for it. A dollar? That's the trouble with you fellas. You have no foresight, no vision. I bet you haven't had a song success up here in years. Now that's the reason we can only give you a dollar for it. Thanks. I'll keep the song. Is that you, Dan? Hiya, honey. We're rich. What? Look, a hundred dollars. All ours. I went up to the public... Hiya, Dan. Oh, hello. Mr. Cook. What are you doing up here? Mr. Cook just got in from New Orleans. He came up to see you, Dan. Oh, the past hour I've been enjoying a visit with the most charming young lady I've had the honor of meeting in years. Well, that's fine. Dan, you sold the bag. Sure, a hundred dollars. Oh, Dan, that's a wonderful price for one song. Yeah, well, it wasn't for one song. It was for ten of them. 
They wouldn't take the ballot unless I threw in my whole repertoire. That is an insult, Dan. You're wasting your time here. Why don't you come back to New Orleans? What? Huh? That's what I came for, Dan, to get you back where you belong. I'm sorry, Mr. Cook. That's out of the question. But you don't understand what's happened. Bones has arranged for new shows, new numbers, new routines to cast to 40 people. Count them. Well, that's fine. Then you won't need me. Dan, why don't we go? We've had a hard time in New York, and you'll be happier if you're back on the stage. Look, Jean, it's a bad idea. But if I... your songs are being sung on the stage and made famous, why, well, the publishers can't help but be interested. She's right there, Dan. And I think it would do me good. It's cold here, and I can't get outdoors. The South would be wonderful for me. Oh, please, Dan, I want to go. Well, I... Please. Well, all right, Mr. Cook. I'll, I'll come back. Dan. Splendid, Dan. Splendid. You never regret it. Never. I'll go and arrange for your transportation. We'll leave tonight. Start packing, my boy. Dan, what are you thinking about? Oh, about you and the trip and a lot of things. You're not worried about anything, are you? It's all going to turn out beautifully, Dan. I know it. Sure. Sure it will. Come on, honey. You must be tired. I'll carry you inside. Mr. DeMille will return in a moment with Bing Crosby, Dorothy Lamour, and Barry Sullivan for Act Three of Dixie. We have a special guest here tonight, and I'd like her to say a word now. She's Lieutenant Junior Grade Helen Rhodes of the Navy Nurse Corps, who served with our Navy at Pearl Harbor. Thank you. There's only one thing I can talk about, Mr. Kennedy, and that's the courage of our fighting men and the modern miracle medicines that are helping us save so many lives. Medicines like the sulfur ointments that prevent the spread of infections, tannic acid for burns, and insulin for shock, and opiates to ease pain. Women may not know that these medicines contain glycerin, and glycerin comes from fat. Yes, from the kind of fats we used to waste in our kitchens. The women in this country have been doing a splendid job saving used fats, but we need more, twice as much more. It's such a little thing to save a tablespoon of fat a day, and it may save their life. I'm sure that from now on, every woman who thought she had too little fat to save will pour it into a salvage can instead of down the drain. In recognition of this important job, the OPA has authorized butchers to give you two meat ration points for every pound of used fat you turn in. Take them proudly. You have earned them. And now, Sally, will you tell women just how to save fats? Use a tin can. Any size will do. Never cardboard or glass. Pour into it all the fats you're not going to use again. Fat from bacon, sausage, soup, stews, or gravies. And this is important. Include the blackened grease from frying pan or roaster, too. All these kinds of fat contain pure glycerin. Keep the fat in your icebox until the container is full. Then turn it into your butcher at once. Don't wait. You may not get an Army or Navy E, but what woman can fail to help in this simple way to see that our fighting men have the healing, life-saving medicines they need? Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. After the play, we'll meet Dorothy and Bing without the blackface. Now here's the curtain for the third act of Dixie, starring Bing Crosby and Dorothy Lamour, with Barry Sullivan. In the boarding house in New Orleans, Millie awaits the arrival of the new guests. With broom and dustpan in hand, she's sweeping the hall savagely when our father bursts through the front door. So here you are. What about it? Millie. I told you when you left here that I wouldn't have him back again, and I meant it. And if that woman he married tries to set foot in this house, she'll find herself flat on her back on the front wall. Now, Millie, you mustn't talk like that. Mr. Emmett is to be considered a professional associate of mine. I demand the same respect for him that you show me. That's just what he's going to get. Millie, please, for my sake, be ladylike. Be, be civilized. All right. I'll hit her daintily. Shh. Here they come. Where is she? I'll wipe. Why, he's wheeling her. She's in a wheelchair. Oh, she is. Didn't you know? She's an invalid, Millie. Oh, no. No, I didn't know. Come right in, Dan. Hello, Millie. Hello. This is my wife. Jean, this is uh, Millie Cook. How do you do? I'm glad to know you, Miss Emmett. Thank you. Well, Dan, it's been a long time. Yeah. How have you been? Pretty good, Millie. And you? Oh, wonderful. A little tired, though. I've been going out too much at night. Well, Emmett, delighted to see you again. Hello, Bones. This is my wife. How do you do? Oh, great pleasure, Mrs. Emmett. Thank you. Emmett, this must be fate. You're coming back just when there's an opening for you in the act. Oh, I'm lucky. 
Well, everything's all settled. Now, all we need is an engagement. Engagement? I thought there was a deal all set for a new show. Well, we had a little bad luck there. That nosy manager at the Maxwell surprised us during a rehearsal before we had the act whipped into shape. Without a word of warning, he canceled our engagement. Oh, well, there must be other theaters in town. Hmm? Oh, several. I haven't given up yet. I'm going to see Mr. Devereaux, the manager of the French Opera House, this afternoon. Oh, they wouldn't have a black-faced act in there. They won't listen to anything unless it's sung by a 200-pound tenor. Well, I only weigh 160, but I'm going to see Devereaux at the Opera House. You won't find him there, friend. He spends all his time playing cards at the Delta Club. Cards, huh? Well, you say cards? That suggests things, eh, Bones? I, um... Thought you didn't approve of my playing cards. Well, not when I'm the victim. Strikes me, Mr. Bones, that Mr. Devereaux would be quite helpless in the hands of a scientific player like yourself. Hmm? Your suggestion is not without merit, Mr. Emmett. Millie, you'd better start thinking up some new costumes. We'll need them. There you are, sir. Four kings. Beat that if you can, sir. Very nice, Mr. Devereaux, but not nice enough. I have four aces. Again, huh? Uh, rake in the chips, Mr. Emmett. Would you care for another game, sir? Uh, not tonight, Mr. Bones. I fear I've overpaid myself to the extent of a couple of thousand dollars. I trust an IOU will suffice, sir? As a matter of fact, it won't. Why, sir? You're inferring my words not good enough for you? I prefer cash. He gad, you're a cheap horse trader. In the South, sir, a gentleman's word is unquestioned. An insult like this demands satisfaction. You'll get it, sir. Wait, wait, sir, wait, sir. Mr. Bones, sir, you're forgetting that I accompanied you here at the request of your wife to prevent you from dueling. You've been fighting too much lately, sir, and she says she will not be mad to a murderer. I detest killing people, but the man asks for satisfaction. I leave it to you. Broadswords, rapiers, pistols, they're all the same thing. Now, now, just a moment, Mr. Bones, sir. I'm sure that Mr. Devereaux will be agreeable to some method of payment. Obviously, he's a man of honor. Well, thank you, sir. Now, may I suggest that you two gentlemen meet privately and arrive at some agreement which will prevent the spilling of blood, uh, you all. Well, very well. I don't mind dueling, but I do hate getting up early in the morning. Well, I'm at your service, sir. Just what's in your mind? Well, I was going to suggest, sir, that I might assume your obligation to Mr. Bones in exchange for you doing me a small favor. Uh, what sort of a favor? Well, perhaps we had best discuss that within the private confines of your office. Uh, very well, sir. Just follow me. All right, there, sir. <laughs> Oh, hello, Millie. Are you going back to the house? Yes, I just... I'll walk with you. Fine. Well, what kind of a card player was Dan? Uh, not nearly as good as he thought he was. We're booked to open at the opera house. Oh, wonderful. Isn't that great? Where are the others? Oh, they're celebrating with a couple of beers. <laughs> Remember the first night we walked home together? Uh huh I guess I was pretty silly that night trying to get you to kiss me. You weren't so silly. I did it, didn't I? Mm, but it was harmless enough, though. What happened since then has proven that. Mm-hmm. I certainly appreciate the way you've treated Jean. Don't give me too much credit, Dan. When you came back today, I was furious. Then when I saw her, I, I began to understand. You like her? She's a very sweet girl. It's wonderful not being mad at you anymore, Dan. I guess there isn't any reason why we shouldn't be as good friends as we ever were. Oh, yeah. yeah well, we'd uh, better go in. Hmm? Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Jean. Didn't see you sitting there. I asked Mr. Cook to wheel me out. It's such a lovely evening, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's it's beautiful. Well, oh, good night. Good night. Come on, come on, get the thing we moving. We're supposed to open this place tonight. Don't ask me why. Well, Bones, how do you like it? You mean to tell me you turned down a dollar for that song? What do you think, Mr. Cook? Damn, my boy, you know I've been in the theater all my life. My feeling is entirely negative. I have to sing it, Dan, and I don't like it either. Well, then I'll sing it myself. That song has got to go in the show. Dan? Yeah, honey, what? Dan, you know more about this than I do. But it seems to me the song should be played faster. Well, not to me it doesn't. People can yell all they want to, but that song is going to stay the way it is. Oh, Mr. Emmett, sir. Uh, could I speak to you a minute, sir? Oh, yes, sure, Mr. Devereaux. Uh, Mr. Emmett, sir, our subscribers were expecting a more dignified type of entertainment. 
We cannot permit a blackface act in the French Opera House, sir. Oh, no? Well, I've got a contract for three months signed by you. What about it? Uh, uh no, sir, but uh, if you fail tonight, are you willing to settle your contract? If we fail, we'll be glad to settle, if you can catch us. Then it's agreed. Goodbye, sir. And for your information, I wish I'd fought that duel, no matter how it came out. Uh, by the way, what happened to your southern accent? Hmm? Oh, I, I had my tonsils taken out. Uh, just... Gentlemen, be seated. Oh, uh, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, how's that? Tell me, are you married? Yes, sir. I've got me a wife and three kids. Oh, so you have a wife and three kids to look out for? Uh, no, just my wife. I can lick the kids. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, introducing a song called Sunday, Monday, Always, sung by Dan Emmett. <laughs> Tell me now what makes the world go round When at the sight of you my heart begins to pound and pound And what am I to do that I be with you I love you someday Monday Aren't you going to watch the show? What are you doing down here? I, I had someone wheel me to Dan's dressing room. I, uh... Jean, what's the matter? Nothing. Why, Millie? Well, the doorman told me a, a boat ticket was delivered to you just before the show started. One ticket. Where are you going, Jean? I, I thought I'd go home for a while. You see, I know Millie. You know what? I've watched you and Dan. I know he's in love with you. Jean, oh, I don't blame him, or you either. Wait a minute. You're all wrong, Jean. I, I'm going to be married tomorrow to Mr. Bones. You, you and Bones? Sure. We're going to announce it tonight. Well, but I, I guess you are surprised, huh? I'll probably have to spend the rest of my life getting him out of bed in the morning and out of jail at night, but it won't be dull anyhow. You made up your mind rather suddenly, didn't you, Millie? Oh, no, just announcing it suddenly. I've been after that man for a long time. I had to circle him, though. He's not the marrying kind. I had to use Dan to make him jealous. Oh, Millie, that's wonderful. Now, come on up and watch the show. And send that ticket back right away. <laughs> All right, Millie. Gentlemen, be seated. Oh, uh, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, the... Well, uh... Why are you always broke? Don't you take your salary to the bank every week? Got to. It's too small to go by itself. <laughs> I hear you have a dog, Sambo. Yes, sir. I done got me the smallest dog, most expensive dog in the world. But I done sold him. You sold your dog for how much? Hundred thousand dollars. Cash? Money? No, I got me two fifty thousand dollar cat. <laughs> Mr. Cook, I smell something. I smell smoke. Good gracious, the theater's on fire. Well, play something. Play something quick. Play something a fast step or hurry up. Play Dixie. Yeah, sing it, Dan. Sing it loud. Just keep the seat, folks. Keep the seat. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times are. I'm not forgotten. Look away. Look away. Look away. Dixieland. In Dixieland where I was born in early on a frosty morning. Look away. Look away. Look away. Dixieland. Then I wish I was in Dixie. Hooray. Hooray. In Dixieland I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie. Away. Away. Away down south in Dixie. Away. Away. Away down south in Dixie. Oh, 
Sam. Sam, come here. Is the fire out? Yes, the fire's out. Where's your pipe? My pipe? Well, well, I, I left it in the plant room. Oh, fine. That's where the fire was. Dan! Dan, get out there! With you and Dixie again, they heat it up! Where's Gene? Gene? Here, Dan. Hey, darling, you were right about the way Dixie should go, but it took a fire to make me believe you. Come on, Dan, come on! Yeah. So long, darling. I'll see you after the show. So long, darling. Bones, come over here. Yes, what is it, Millie? Dixie, don't make any appointments for tomorrow. Hey, why not? Because we're going to be married. Married? Well, this is very sudden, Millie. Well, at least you can say thank you. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. You're welcome. Away down south, Dixie. Away, away, away down south in Dixie. Before our stars return for a curtain call, here's a suggestion to mothers of wartime brides. In Ceylon, a new son-in-law has to pay the bride's parents the cost of washing the bride's clothes from birth right up to the day she's married. Why, Mr. Kennedy, that wouldn't be much if she's a Lux girl. No, Lux is a thrifty way to take care of clothes, keeps them new looking longer, too. And making things last is mighty important these wartime days. If you've been shopping lately, you've probably noticed that many types of fine cottons and rayons just aren't being made anymore. Looms are too busy turning out materials for war. So it's up to us to take extra special care of those nice things we have. You couldn't use anything safer than Lux Flakes. A little Lux goes so far, you'll find you can do an amazing amount with one big box. Use it not only for underthings and stockings and washable dresses, but for your curtains, too. And washable slip covers, bedspreads, everything around the house that's safe in water alone. If your dealer is out of Lux Flakes today, be patient. He'll have more soon. You can be sure Lux is worth waiting for. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Right now, Bing Crosby, Dorothy L'Amour, and Barry Sullivan are on the road to a curtain call. Oh, sorry, C.B. Dottie and I can't be on the road to any place without Bob Hope. (laughs) Bing, I I want you to know that I didn't agree with those other producers at Paramount when they they saw Dixie for the first time. Well, what did they say, Mr. DeMille? No hope. (laughs) (laughs) A run of DeMille opinion, I think. <laughs> well, Dottie's traded hope for Technicolor in riding high. Yes. You know, I, I like to make a picture without a sarong once in a while. You mean you don't even wear a sarong in riding high? What's sarong about that? It's a western. <laughs> oh, you girl, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's different. I, I, guess, uh, I guess maybe Santa Claus will stop at your house after all. Oh, no, didn't you know? The old boy gave up. You shouldn't do that to our Dottie. He figures he can't fill her stocking as well as she does. <laughs> yeah, I guess Santa goes to pictures, too Say, Bing, you must have found Christmas shopping quite a problem this year Nothing to it, Barry Just went in and told the man I'll take whatever you got for us <laughs> What play are you shopping for next week, Mr. DeMille? Now, we've got it already, Daddy The metro goldwyn Mayor picture, Kathleen And next Monday, we have the original stars of the picture Shirley Temple and Herbert Marshall Next week brings you a new Shirley Temple A grown-up young lady now, but with the same charm and talent we knew in a tiny girl. And Kathleen is a delightful way to meet her again. Time marches on, and Shirley Temple has dates. Wouldn't miss it, C.B. Good night. Night. Good night. Good night. (laughs) Happy Christmas to all of you. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen... As our third wartime Christmas draws near, it seems to me that we are closer to the true Christmas than for many years past. Closer to the Christmas immortalized by Dickens. The holiday our fathers knew on snowbound farms. And to the Christmas of the little inn of Bethlehem. The false trappings have fallen by the wayside. A warmer kinship joins us all together and brings us here at home close to our own, out there. From an American army sergeant has come a message that is especially fitting for this week. The sum of all his experience in battle is in these few simple words. There are no atheists in foxholes. May we at home profit by that thought.
now, to all men and women of goodwill, wherever you may be, our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, join me in wishing you every blessing of the Christmas season. And we invite you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Shirley Temple and Herbert Marshall in Kathleen with Francis Gifford. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. And folks, here's a date to remember. It's next Wednesday, December 22nd. That's the day when once again you can hear one of radio's proudest moments. That traditional Yuletide treat, Lionel Barrymore in his best-loved role of old Scrooge in Charles Dickens' immortal story, A Christmas Carol. It will be broadcast on Wednesday, December 22nd, over the Columbia Network. See your local paper for time and station. Dorothy L'Amour and Barry Sullivan will star together in the Paramount picture, Rainbow Island. Heard in tonight's play were Leo Cleary as Mr. Cook, Louise Arthur as Jean, and Cliff Clark, Norman Field, Ed Emerson, Charles Seal, Horace Willard, Eddie Marr, and Griff Barnett. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast by International Short Wave to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, inviting you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Shirley Temple and Herbert Marshall with Francis Gifford in Kathleen. Say, lady, take a minute. What for? I'm buying vitamins. Exactly. And before you buy, look at the labels. Take a minute, see what's in it. Some products, you know, leave out vitamins A and D or the essential B complex.